Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to this uh, ITIF Center for Data Innovation event this morning on uh, uh, such a big data and, and the scientific enterprise. Uh, a lot of people talk about the data, but they don't necessarily think about it in terms of science, which has been, really long been a pioneer in this area. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to my uh, colleague, Josh New, but I just want to acknowledge our colleague, Renee von Schoenberg. We met recently when I was in Brussels, and uh, he'll explain a little bit about what we're doing, but there's fascinating work in Brussels now with what they call the part of the digital single market. They have an initiative there on the science cloud, and so that's, a, I think, really interesting development that we can certainly learn from on, on our side. And also just want to recognize my colleague, Jerry Sheehan. Jerry and I were to you this 25 years ago at OCA, so it's great to connect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to a good panel. Josh? Thank you, everyone. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Morning, everyone. Thank you for coming, uh, for braving the cold. Uh, my name is Joshua New. I'm a policy analyst at ITF Center for Data Innovation. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy think tank focusing on data issues. Uh, we are very excited to, to explore the, the idea of open science. Um, it's become particularly uh, a hot topic, uh, given the, the Joe Biden cancer moonshot, it's getting a lot of attention, um, rightfully so, we think. Um, so we're going to be talking about that today. We're going to be talking about the implications of, of new technologies on science, on opportunities for international collaboration beyond just curing cancer, which is, you know, ambitious. Um, so I'll go down the line. I'll introduce our panelists. Uh, we have a great panel here today. Uh, Dr. Von Schomburg, as Rob mentioned, is the team leader for science policy at the European Commission. Um, he has uh, doctorates in science and technology as well as philosophy, and he's the uh, author and co-editor of 14 books. Um, next to him, we have Angel Pizarro, who is the technical business development manager on the scientific research computing team at Amazon Web Services, uh, where he over oversees the global genomics and life science efforts. Uh, ben Schneiderman is a, is a distinguished university professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maryland, uh, and he's a founding director of the Human Computer Interaction Laboratory. Um, he also is the author of the new book, The New ABCs of Research, Achieving Breakthrough Collaborations. Um, we can be talking about that today. It was just published, uh, and we'll be, we'll be addressing this as well. Uh, next to him, we have Jerry Sheehan, the Assistant Director for Scientific Data and Innovation and Information excuse me, at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where he leads the administration efforts to research, to access, to increase access pardon, to the results of federally funded research. Um, next to him, oh, sorry, messed up the word. Uh, no, sorry, excuse me. Then finally, we have Dr. Phil Bourne, uh, the Associate Director for Data Science at the National Institutes of Health. Um, in that role, he sets a, he oversees the oversees data science um, at NIH in general, uh, including supporting the sharing and sustainability of data tools. Um, he also has a, a laundry list of awards and other honorary positions um, that would take over. So, getting started, uh, I'd like to set the stage a little bit. Um, how has cloud computing uh, internet in general, uh, supercomputing, data sharing, fundamentally change science. So all these all these technological developments that are that people talk about quite a bit, how has that made science different today compared to 10 years ago? And where do you envision that going the next 10 years? Of course it's changed. Well, uh, how far will it go? What's the, the true extent of this transformation? You just down the line. <laughs> yes, a short question. I hope it needs probably a very long answer. Sure. So, but, uh, I, I will not do that uh, because I think uh, I, I think the, the, the essential uh, thing in, for open science, at least, uh, is that uh, there will be a strong refocus from from as a scientist. And let's take it from the perspective of a scientist uh, from publishing as fast as possible to sharing knowledge as fast as possible. Sure. And uh, this, this letter is, of course, enabled and, uh, by, by the new uh, technologies at hand, are very obvious. And um, what we... Uh, uh, so, so the, the significance there is, of course, that the efficiency of science, the, and I mean then this, this, the system of science itself, uh, will, will, of course, be increased by... Uh, by better sharing and optimizing the use of resources. Uh, it will also become more reliable because we have better means of verification of data. It becomes more transparent. Uh, so it, the, the whole operation of science as a system as such becomes more reliable, more efficient, uh, probably also more uh, responsive to societal challenges. 
Um, um, but uh, these changes, they occur bottom up, but I think uh, quite some strong policy interventions are needed to foster this uh, opportunity, I would say. Um, maybe I'll come back to that later. We are going to be talking quite a bit about the, the policy. I should, I should not yeah. talk too long, so, but that's sure. a fast shot. No, that's great. And sorry, I forgot to mention, initially, uh, we are live streaming this, and we are, will be uh, uh, answering questions on Twitter. Um, so. All the panelists' Twitter handles are up there. Uh, please use the hashtag data innovation for anyone watching online. Feel free to tweet your questions. Um, we'll be doing half moderator Q&A and then half uh, audience Q&A. So feel free to voice your questions. So, <clears throat> I guess I'm next. Um, in, the, in the scientific computing team here at, at Amazon, we like to do uh, espouse two things. One is time to science, which uh, Renee covered. Uh, reducing the time to a result to go out into the community and for that community to be able to utilize it straight away is incredibly important to science because it's not any individual result that matters, it's what people do with it afterwards and builds upon uh, each other. So having a collaborative space like the cloud with, with which to share results and be able to um, collaborate uh, across internationally using the same language, the same security compliance uh, uh, frameworks, the same the same code essentially being able to not only share the data but also the, all of the steps and, and processes and methods that led to that data in the first place is a, a big game changer. Another um, thing about time to science is just being able to scale an architecture and the infrastructure to get to your answer faster. Right? Uh, we all in, in the HPC and science space play this capacity, maximal capacity problem which with what can you afford. Right. Everybody plays that. We play that um, within our regions. We, uh, supercomputing centers um, do have a budget and they are, have a maximal capacity problem that they can do. But when you have a much, much larger set of uh, people using your infrastructure and uh, shared infrastructure, you get to set that bar a little bit higher. Right, And then you take that into the scale where you're addressing different industries. Uh, not just science, but also finance, media, gaming everything else and you suddenly have a very very high bar to the maximal problem that you can do. Uh, the other thing that we like to espouse um, is in terms of reducing the time to science is the scalability aspect uh, but also just uh, sorry there's a democratizing it and and the access to it across different communities right because not everybody <coughs> <clears throat> has the money out there in the world to build supercomputers. Uh, when you can lease it or rent it for a short period of time, that opens up science to a much broader set of researchers that would have not been able to do this type of science before. And that really matters when you start getting into petabyte scale data sets, uh, such as the work that we're getting from genomics these days. Good morning. Thank you. No, not a <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> uh, good morning. Thank you, Josh, and the panelists and the CDI for organizing what I think is a very important <coughs> event, an important topic. Um, uh, my, my career has been tied to this issue at many stages episodically. Uh, the Microsoft-initiated uh, fourth paradigm effort, Tony Hayes' book of 10 years ago, I think laid out a lot of these issues and, uh, and, and showed the problems. Uh, from my encounter with NASA, working for NASA, they, their question was, they have all these uh, Earth scientists using data from their satellites, and they give grants to them, and they would like to increase the data sharing. That data collected for one purpose could be used for another purpose. Sounds reasonable. So one of our recommendations was that the renewal of a grant should be partially predicated on the number of different people who use the data collected by any one group. That was not possible in the governance structure. So for me, the main thing is there are no technical problems in sharing data. It's all social. It's all cultural. It's all about how you create the incentives for people, organizations, companies to do the right thing, governments too. Okay, how do we create the way, the incentives that will get scientists to put in the substantial effort to clean the data, to make it valuable for others, to annotate it, to curate it, and distribute it, and then answer questions. Data is not a piece of technology, it's a social structure. Once you have the data, you're always going to have questions about it. There's going to be things wrong in the data. You need to create a social structure, 
Every data set needs a, needs a blog and a discussion group. Every data set needs an annual conference to celebrate the work that's been done, to share it, and to, and to understand how people are using it. So we need to make heroes by giving awards and recognition for those who work to share data and then those who actually use somebody else's data. There are disincentives at every stage. We need to change the governance structure and make it work for everyone. That's the agenda that I see. <coughs> okay, hard to follow on to all the comments so far, but I, th I think it's true, right? In the information technology, the cloud, and the other services are transforming almost every aspect of the way we can do science, from the, the kinds of data we collect, the volumes of data we collect, the ways we can analyze them, and the way we can communicate the results of, of science. And I think there are both these technological issues, many of which so it have not been completely solved, but we've got a lot more technological capability than we had a few years ago that enabled much more to happen now. The key issues, many of the key issues relate to policy and cultural change. I think the one, one point I want to elaborate on is, is this notion of the, the community of researchers, right? And the extent to which by making science more open, we can encourage even more types of people to engage in scientific and innovative activities, right? It's not just the scientific community that we traditionally think of. We have new types of scientists. They can be data scientists and others. It's also engaging citizens and communities in science. It's ensuring that uh, small businesses and innovators in industry have access to information they didn't have before because we have both the technology and the capability to pull that information together make it more discoverable, make it more accessible, and I think then we can use it to, to bring in a much broader set of, uh, of actors to help us solve a number of the challenges that we're trying to address from a national point of view, whether it's energy or environment or climate or economic growth, and we can find a much broader, more open set of people, which will also help engage them more and help them better understand what science and innovation is all about, which I think has other good benefits for science, uh, however to find it, in, in connecting it better to our, our national needs and connecting it better to the citizen. One of the problems of being at the end is by the time it gets to you, have forgotten what the original <laughs> question was. But, uh, I mean, let me just make a sort of open comment in the spirit of what's been said. And I, I do this as uh, both someone who's responsible for data science at the NIH, but also someone who's actually a practicing scientist. I want to sort of emphasize the side of the practicing scientists that hasn't really been said yet, uh, which is really, as we do this science, and I speak uh, with a certain bias from the life sciences, of course, is that the problems we're trying to address are much more complex than we've ever faced before. Um, and we realize that we can't uh, necessarily solve them. It's not one person sitting in a garage with a pencil anymore uh, for many problems. <coughs> Uh, and so collective efforts are really important. And I think that that drive towards collaboration to solve problems uh, is a you know, point to your book. Here's your chart. There's a lead in for you then. Um, so that's one side of it. And then I just say the other side, which is uh, that, that relates to really the subject of today, and I would just cast it a little differently. And I would just say that perhaps something that's obvious, but that science for a good part of my career was very much, which is quite long now, as you can tell by looking at me, is, uh, was predominantly analog. And I think you know, the obvious statement is that now science is part of a digital enterprise. And that digital enterprise enables us to do things in different ways that we have, were really not quite so feasible. And yet the, the governance structure for a lot of science is still very much embedded in the analog of the past. Uh, the fact, for example, that, uh, which is a hobby horse for me and Daniel Nietzsche is sitting in the front row, is that you know, we still transmit the majority of our knowledge in, uh, about science as an effectively an analog form in the form of a PDF. This is so arcane in the digital era, and yet we persist with that because that's where the business models are built, where the governance models are built. And, you know, I think we, we need to change, you know, we need to, it's going to be a slow process, but it's all about cultural change, to change that, that, those perceptions uh, and move forward so that we actually capture <coughs> much more of the whole research life cycle, and we make that available uh, and, and executable. And that's where these technologies offer so much excitement in beginning to uh, realize that uh, different kind of model. Great. Uh, just a side note, uh, moving to machine-readable data is music to my ears, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, so we, a lot of you talked about the, the, the 
social and, and policy barriers to kind of a more open science approach, which I want to talk about quite a bit. But first, to, to finish setting the stage and, and to you know really build the case for why this is so important. Uh, ben, in your book, you you mentioned that the 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 obstacles that science is trying to tackle now today are much more complex, and they've they've grown with the complexity of the technology that they use. So, what can what you know in theory in a perfectly open science world with all the technology at disposal that we could hopefully get to in ten years from now? What are the kind of problems that we are within reach that we could solve um, if we if we go about this the right way? You mean the data sharing problems or the or the social problems? Uh, uh, the the the, the, the cultural. The science, science the problems. challenges yeah. that we we're trying to set out. I, I like, I echo Phil Bourne's comment that the problems of today are immense. They're really dramatically different, and they no longer satisfy the 19th or 18th century models of reductionist laboratory controlled studies. We're doing things on a much more ambitious scale, and the, the agenda for me is, is things like healthcare delivery. Okay, <coughs> you got a pretty good model of health, there's a lot more to be done. But healthcare delivery, a $2 trillion industry, is really a challenge. How do you change behaviors? I'm part of a movement designed to construct this notion of a learning health system. How do you take evidence from all the 5,000 hospitals across the US, share that data, find out what treatments work and which ones don't, and propagate that news in such a trustworthy way that people will actually apply those things? So that's an immense socio-technical problem. Environmental sustainability, energy, community safety, agriculture, transportation, one after another, the agendas of today are, are really profound. However, the good news, not to be daunted by all this, the good news is the tools we have are much more powerful than the past, you know? Uh, you know, we've come a long way from Tycho Brahe writing down his formulas, or, or his sightings, and, and Johannes Kepler, using sharing the data and making insights we've gotten much more powerful tools that support collaboration the, you know one of the, the themes here that and what i see in the in the so first in the 30 years of the web's history we now see the capacity to find papers find data share information collaborate discuss propose partial solutions confirm them and have more ambitious results published social media technologies, visual communications, all of these things have made a huge difference. So what I see are more ambitious project teams that are taking on much larger projects. When I looked at medical studies of 15, 20 years ago, it was a group at a hospital or a research center that studied 800 people in a controlled study and produced a result. Now I see a paper which has 10 groups around the world each of them studying maybe 800 patients and having a much more powerful, ambitious paper. At the same time, funding agencies have much raised expectations about what's, what researchers can do. And that's also good news. So, you know, my message also is that research is becoming more central to making our future better because the power of research results from these shared data can actually dramatically accelerate the way medical knowledge is acquired, disseminated, and then put to work. I think that's that's a key challenge. I guess just by kind of one short story, one of our, you know, our work is on, on electronic health records, and we developed a tool for looking at event analytics. And just two weeks ago, a researcher from Center for Disease Control and Prevention in, in uh, Atlanta had used our tool to study Giardia. She had 5,400 Giardia cases. And as you may know, Giardia is a parasitic, not a bacterial uh, disease. Yet, many of these patients got bacterial treatments, even though they had the test. The knowledge was just not applied in a reasonable way. The evidence that she could now show at scale and then hopefully disseminate and change people's treatment policies would be a dramatic payoff. So I think that's where the action is. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on, on you know, where, what we think this could mean for, for scientific discovery, the kind of problems that we could tackle in the future. What? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> maybe it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, all big challenges we have at a global scale, actually, be it from climate change, uh, issues like that, they are of enormous uh, complexity. So uh, this is, of course, uh, the area of data-intensive science. I mean, data-intensive science 
drives uh, you know solutions towards things. But this requires this uh, spend we need that collaboration globally, networked uh, network science, and um, probably it will change the image of science actually um, because you know just to to, to, uh, um, to um, explain this a little bit. I mean, we normally give Nobel Prize winners, uh, you know, they, are, they, they, they reproduce sort of image of science as a heroic individual scientist who did a great discovery. Um, but I think data intensive science is rather unheroic and requires an op enormous amount of people to, to, to <coughs> solve problems. I mean, just yesterday I think it was announced that uh, Einstein's theory was confirmed by a gravitational world. Don't, uh, don't try to understand this, but <laughs> if you look at the paper where it is published, you see it has 1,000 authors. Uh, and everybody say, well, this is worthy of the Nobel Prize, but who are you going to give it to? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they will not get it, because simply it's 1,000 people. But it's a very, very significant, everybody agrees. And I think in all the areas, so be it from climate change, lead all the big societal challenges require this type of science. Uh, it will be unheroic, but enormously important. Quick. I think it's heroic. <laughs> <laughs> I, do too. I, th I think really just to sort of pull out something that's probably implicit in a lot of our discussion, but I think the, the this and discussion of electronic health records and using that to help improve healthcare delivery, even our knowledge of how, how disease progresses and effectiveness of treatment, maybe compared to the LIGO uh, model, you know, where we build scientific instruments to collect scientific data and scientists analyze them. I think what we're seeing because of the digitization of virtually all aspects right, of our lives is the ability to use information that was not previously accessible and analyze it in a scientific way. So we take healthcare data which was there for your physician or the hospitals to use for their own practice, right? But now that it's in digital form, we can begin to analyze it in new ways that give us scientific insights. So I think the scope of what we think of as being science and data-driven science can expand dramatically as we get access to these different kinds of data, which also bring with them a whole you know, host of challenges around the privacy and confidentiality and so forth, which are, again, social issues that, that uh, are, are driven by the technological capabilities we have. So I would just say that there's uh, a couple of lessons from the past uh, as we move forward with this. I think we're all in agreement about the need to address complexity and the fact that in the digital universe we, we have new opportunities. But this has been going on for some time, obviously, and I just speak from my own sort of experience with, for example, the Human Genome Project, uh, which was undoubtedly a collaborative and collective project um, that was, uh, I think, the, the, the lesson there is that Clearly, that has had huge impact. They are multi-billion dollar industries, but uh, but, that, the, but it actually took longer than we anticipated. And I think as we move into this new digital era, uh, you know, we, we're all excited about it. But I think there's, we also have to be a little cautious about how soon some of this is really going to have Im economic impact. And ultimately, it, it's the economics that's going to drive all this. And we can sit here and as I can sit here at I actually speak for myself as an academic and make all these predictions, but the fact is it's going to be the economics that drive a lot of it. <laughs> the the other thing I would say is, and partly because I'm always making extreme efforts to get myself fired, uh, so I can <laughs> say that in many ways what we do as funding agencies does not promote the idea of what we've just heard so much about around collaboration. We've actually created, by the way, we fund for the most part, a hyper-intensive uh, and competitive environment that uh, is really working against um, some of these, uh, these noble uh, goals we talked about. So I think we're, and certainly, you know, I can only speak from an agency, but we're really looking into that uh, and how we do fund things to try and begin to address this in some way. So I think that, again, sort of speaks to part, in part to the governance model, which is a really important aspect of this as well because I don't want to be left out. Uh, the, uh, I just have one, one thing to say, and it and touches on other points that our uh, glorious panel here have uh, mentioned, but I want to make explicit. One is uh, we have the opportunity to have real-time or close to real-time feedback on data collection and actionable items, and I think that's going to change science fundamentally in a lot of different areas, from 
from atmospheric to environmental studies to public health policy and reaction that's disaster recovery. I mean, there, there's a whole host of uh, problems, and both from a science and a policy perspective, that are now going to be addressed just because we have the communication frameworks there and the technology and, <coughs> and the instrumentation to be able to enact a change, an actual change in real time. And the other thing that we've touched on and talked around, but I want to make explicit, is that we've seen an incredible uh, change in the types of science that we can do, and it's been <coughs> led by technology and instrumentation, right? The human genome being one of the uh, best examples, but they're not alone, right? The bigger colliders uh, give us much more insight into uh, the science that we can do. Uh, Self-driving cars are, are really being put forward by sensor systems that have <coughs> Uh, digital optics, better uh, you know, um, scanning capabilities in different weather conditions. I mean, really, we are in a. It's hard to predict the types of science problems that we'll be able to tackle because so much of it has been driven by new capabilities and instrumentation, in both the collection and the analysis side. And I'm really pretty excited to see what uh, what a real time component will do in order to drive the, the rest of, of science going forward in the next five years. Great. Um, so. Now that we've established how great this will be, uh, let's talk about uh, you know the obstacles to, to getting there. What are, what are the challenges facing uh, this opportunity? Um, so I, I said I'd be mentioning it. Uh, the Joe Biden's cancer moonshot, uh, the, the the idea that we're going to cure cancer. The the specific details haven't quite materialized yet, but what we do know is that Joe Biden has talked quite a bit about uh, breaking down data silos. Uh, these, these critically valuable genomic data, medical data. Um, it's just so hard for researchers to access in any sort of scale to make it valuable that, it, that it's, it's severely impeding progress. Um, but given how much we know that, and this might be a, an, an obvious answer, but I'd just like to, to bring it up, given how the value of, of sharing data for, for scientific collaboration, for, for discovery, because we, we already know that's important and a lot of the scientific community agrees that this is a critically important uh, objective, why is data so siloed already? Um, just what are, what are the main reasons? You, you, we mentioned social and, and, and policy barriers, but are there other actors at play that, that are, are restricting this kind of open approach? And, and yeah, anyone wants to jump in? Um, <clears throat> well, maybe uh, I can say something on this. Um, well, I mean, of course, notably, if you are in the European Union with 28 member states, uh, you have a very fragmented uh, research infrastructure. With but where data sharing is not necessarily enabled uh, across borders. So that's, that's a barrier. I mean, it's obviously also in the global context. Uh, it's fragmented also in another way because it's, it's split up in disciplines. Uh, we have a big research infrastructures, uh, Alex, for instance, on biomedical data. But uh, you have all kinds of other research infrastructures which are specific for particular disciplines. And um, they are not uh, compatible. The data, sh I mean, so interdisciplinary science is actually hindered by this fact. Um, there's, of course, a policy point to it, and this is why we uh, have this idea to, uh, to implement the so called European Open Science Clouds, which would federate all these uh, research infrastructures. Uh, but in order to do that, it's, it's not uncomplicated. I mean, you have to have. Uh, standards for data sharing, you have to have uh, a governance in place which uh, uh, allows you to uh, share data across borders according to uh, data protection rules, uh, etc. So there's quite a, a complex uh, political issue to be handled there. But this is now high on the agenda. And, uh, we will, the Commission will make a proposal by the end of the year. So, but these are the challenges, and obviously this requires quite a lot of governance, uh, from, uh, which actually extends uh, the science field. But it's enormously <laughs> important to, uh, to enable actually all the services attached to this uh, research infrastructure for analyzing, for reuse of data, for exploiting this data. So there's a big agenda ahead. Sure. I, I think you cite the problem, but I would push you upstream in the, in the causal landscape of why countries don't encourage sharing of data, why groups don't share, why the siloed effects of institutions occur. 
And it is because of fundamental reason that research groups, countries, <coughs> organizations are in competition. And they have worked hard to collect their data. They see it as an advantage for them to create the results in the research, breakthroughs, and they are reluctant to give it to others. Furthermore, it takes effort to share data. It's not a free, and you don't just flick a switch. Hey, you have to answer questions. You have to provide services. You have to provide, you know, even Amazon cloud services, right? Uh, it's not, it's not, it's not, you know, the, so, so the point is, I would say, to change the incentive structure. How do you reward those who contribute? You know, in basketball, we have the idea of an assist, or in most sports, okay? Someone scores the goal, but there's an assist. And we want to make the idea of the sport of science to have the notion of an assist, that people who provide data are assisting others, and they get some recognition. They get partial recognition. This and is uh, going to be a little bit of boring panel because we agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was thinking, you know, we have some kind of quarrel or something. No, 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 I, no we have, we, we, uh, we uh, I mean, this is actually, you know, I, I mentioned one side of our so-called open science, which I know this is the setup of this cloud. And, and one other part, I mean, we have actually five dimensions to it, is, is what you just mentioned, you know, we have to create uh, we, have, we actually have to change uh, the career system of researchers. We have to uh, give them credit for creating <coughs> data sets like we otherwise do for publications. We have to uh, create uh, incentives to engage in collaboration, which is not in all fields uh, incentivized or rewarded. Um, <coughs> this, this is all going to happen. I mean, th I mean this is Well, we let me push you there. If you want controversial, so you say we have to. And I would like to hear a more specific who the we is. So, I mean, you're right. I think, let's focus very specifically. If someone publishes a paper, there's an editorial review board, and there's an acceptance or rejection or revision. Yes. I would like to see the establishment of an editorial review board for data sets. Mm -hmm. And when someone, <coughs> then it, with standards for proposing a data set, and when that data set is accepted by the board, they receive visible notification on websites, on whatever that they have contributed, and that becomes an item they can add to their, well, let me finish, to their resume. And furthermore, that, you, that the changes to the academic appointments <clears throat> and promotion process indicate that not just published papers, but published data sets are a contribution. Uh, well, my, my, my we do want to let everyone yeah, weigh yeah, in. Sorry, so. yeah, yeah, <laughs> I had this feeling that I had to respond. This is like, I feel like we're just a bit like Republican. But, um, <laughs> Didn't we see this on television? Like, <laughs> yeah. but now, go ahead, Bernie Sanders, Sanders here. Yeah, make, make your response to uh, to that, and then I'll, I'll follow. No, I, I will then be sure, though, because I certainly don't want to take the floor too long. No, I mean, again, uh, I, I agree, and I think there are actually alternative business models out oh, there already doing this. Thousand in biomedical field and so on, and, and we have to help these guys. I think there's a lot of agreement around the problems, and I think it's easy because it, that's a relatively easy thing to talk about. The solutions are just now beginning to start to emerge. We've heard a little about that, so I think that that's where it's going to be a lot harder. But let me just say something about about data and the, and the sort of and sharing aspect of it. I'd say there's a lot of data that's being shared already. But there are sort of fundamental issues that create these silos that you're talking about. And some of those come, for example, from uh, the way we fund data. So we fund data at either a national uh, or even a lower level, uh, but we all use that data. So uh, and there's a sort of, and to some degree, an inequality about who pays to ma maintain that data versus who uses that data on a global scale. We haven't really tried to address that. Um, and it's not an easy problem. So as an example, uh, and so that really comes down to how you fund and who funds it across uh, national and international boundaries. And solving those problems, as I say, is not easy. So just as an example, we're currently running an open science prize uh, where the idea is that international groups get together. They actually propose uh, doing some, uh, it's something innovative on open data and it can be on open, open analytics as well that's being funded jointly by the Wellcome Trust, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and the National Institutes of Health. So I just told you exactly what it is, and it took me one minute. It took a year to get this in place, to make it work. 
because of all of the, 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 some of it is sort of cultural legacy, but some of it's just, you know, bureaucratic <laughs> rules. You, you know, the, you can't spend US taxpayers' money in Europe and vice versa. But you, <clears throat> but you can overcome these, these obstacles and move this forward. And so that's one, you know, sort of one reason we have siloing is because of the, the way we fund things. But also, even within a given agency, like, like my own, again, I'm, I'm moving towards the, the door of, of being fired, um, is that we've historically funded things as really separate data types. And, and what that, that is, has sort of created silos. And that worked very well for a long time, again, speaking as a practitioner, because I only used a small number of data types at any one time. Now our, our research is much more translational. So we're actually using data across multiple data types. And what do you find? You find that the, all of the pieces of data you want in all these different silos, and each one of those silos has strove to be different in every single way than every other one, which really slows things down. So, but the idea that's coming out of the cloud is, is really this much more of this sort of homogenization and the ability to put data together. And of course, there are, point out, there are lots of obstacles to that. But it does create a new environment to be uh, to address some of these complex uh, scientific problems we've been talking about. <coughs> Just to add to that, I think when we talk about data silos, I actually think we're being generous. <laughs> and that I think the, you know the biggest part. I think of silos, right? You know, you see them in the, in the Midwest around farms, right? There's a lot of grain stored in them, and there are many of them. I think the problem with data is that so much of it is not even collected and gathered. In essence, it's or it's, or it's being gathered by individuals, and, it, and it's sitting in their own kind of home pantry, not even in the silo. Um, and and the questions then about how do you how do you improve access to that data? You know, some colleagues and I looked across the biomedical literature to try to estimate how much of the data that's used in biomedical research is in a silo or is in a, a public repository. And the answer was not very encouraging. I think we found 12, 13 percent. You know, identified a, a data repository in which the data were stored. So it's, I think we have this multiplicity of places in which data are, uh, are sitting, and we don't have a lot of, um, well, I think we're missing, but I, I would say it's sort of the, the, the carrots, the sticks, and the enablers for data sharing. Right, so we've been talking about incentives and lack thereof. Well, you know, why should I? Do I get attribution for doing it? Can I get uh, you know, different types of research funding if, I, if I'm sharing my data in certain ways? And I think without those, because there are a lot of you know, difficult questions about how do we recognize data sharing as something that should be citable and attributable and so forth. So we've been pushing on, this is you know, OSTP and other federal funding agencies and other funders outside the government, kind of pushing on the mandate side. Right? Around certain types of research, there are going to be expectations or requirements for data sharing or data management. So we have now from the, from the OSTP memo almost three years ago today, I guess it'll be three years next week, Know, an increasing number of agencies that are that are establishing requirements for data management plans. Right? Let's build these the thinking about what you're going to do with your data into the research design at the beginning. So we have some way of the, of then giving an opportunity for not just thinking about the design, even having that design evaluated, right? And some feedback maybe through peer review or other, other procedures. But I think coming back to what, what Ben and others were saying earlier, I mean then there's the, the question of enablers, right? The reason we need to put band-aids in place or the sticks and we have, you know, we need a need for carrots is because the challenge overcoming the barriers of, of sharing data are difficult. Where am I going to put it? What are the standards? How do I curate it? How much does it cost to curate it? And I think as we can make progress on those issues, and I think the examples that have been most successful in data sharing, even if what we've done is data silos, are those where with all of the regular, well, sorry, all of the stakeholders that are involved, from the scientific community to the funders to the publishers and others, kind of come up with some agreements about what's the most important data in this area to try to <coughs> for the long term. Do we have a good place to put it? And can it go in a cloud type of an environment? What are our expectations about you know when the data should be made accessible and when it should be you know shared and what are the, the, the obligations of those who have deposited data in terms of describing it well enough so someone else can understand it? And what are the obligations on those who are going to make use of it? in order to cite, recognize, and uh, provide attribution, and so forth. And I think that kind of, you know, it's a, it's a holistic sort of approach of bringing stakeholders together to try to make, you know, the activation energy needed to do effective data sharing can we, can we lower it. So 
even with maybe less uh, clear incentives and even with you know, less strong mandates, people will be more uh, willing to share and able to share their data. So first of all, let's just get away from silos. We'll just call them cylinders of excellence. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> I think this attribution, this re the reward system, uh, is the to me the fundamental piece that really has to change uh, if we're going to really drive all this forward. Uh, I mean, technologies will help, but I think it's, it's that that's going to be the most important. And I think we all have the responsibility to contribute to that change, whether we be a producer of data, a user of data, um, uh, whether we're responsible for funding data, whether we're in institutions that produce data, uh, we, we really all need to work to uh, change the, the, the model of scholarship because it's clear, as I'm sort of talking about the digital enterprise at the beginning, that what, what has value in the system is changed and the way we measure that value right now is absolutely and totally and utterly out of whack. Uh, I'll give you a specific example. I've used this many times in my own experience. I have a paper in, in biomedicine that's been cited over 20,000 times, which is, is a lot. Okay? No one has ever read that paper. <laughs> no one. Because it's a paper that cites a database that I happen to be involved with in maintaining. So, why, what, so we, we're actually doing a falsification here. The data is what has value. And yet we have to, we have to cite a paper about that data. Why don't we just cite... Sorry, I'm going on a diatribe. But why don't we just cite the data itself? And, you know, we're now actively within our own little sphere at the NIH working very hard to bring that into reality. And I think that, that sort of, that's a step that others you know, will do, build on up and as well, to begin to change and make this sort of cultural change. So we have the ability to cite data. It's, it's actually trivial technologically to do that. But what does it bring? It suddenly brings this whole new value into the, into the network. You, we use the citation network all the time. Everybody gets evaluated by, you know, how many, you know, what's the, what's, what impacts the journals they published in, you know, what's their age factor, all that. Let's start bringing this, these data sets into that citation network. We can measure how valuable they are to the enterprise by how many times they're looked at in the same way we have metrics now for doing with individual papers. And we just need, you know, institutions and, and the people who make, the, who make promotions and so forth actually, uh, you know, accept those as bona fide forms uh, of scholarship. And that will begin, I think that ultimately will be the sort of thing that changes the system. Uh, probably in my own mind, much faster, more than uh, any sort of technological change. When you say we just need, that sounds, that <laughs> seems to <laughs> underestimate the magnitude of the problem. How are you going to get that to happen? Well, I think the, yeah, I'll give you a specific example down the chain. Right, so we've already had uh, from these guys, uh, that, you know, the top levels of federal government, we've had these directives that we must share data. Right? And then funding agencies are putting into place, they've been required to respond to that directive, and they're putting in ways to you know, improve data sharing plans, uh, improve uh, procedures for uh, sharing data. All of that's good. The piece I just described is then, okay, now let's move to the citation of that data. So, you know, if the NIH is a, is a, the you know, largest biomedical funder in the world is to say, we encourage data citation, and however how strong you want to say encourage, that would cause immediately people in papers, in, um, <coughs> uh, in grant applications and so on, would start using those sites, would start producing and providing those citations. So that has, a, and then it has a trickle down effect. And then you start, then you know, the agency, or the academic institutions who receive money from these agencies, money always, again, it comes back to this notion of economy, which I think is so important in all of this. But suddenly, the vice presidents of research and so forth suddenly get this message that, oh, the NIH thinks data citation is important. You know, maybe we ought to be paying more attention to data if we want to get more grants and get more indirects into our institution. And so you have this trickle-down effect. And then they start saying to their tenure committees, I think you should actually consider the importance of what people have contributed outside of, you know, papers in <coughs> journals. The other elements of scholarship, we're talking about data here, but there's also analytics. Uh, you know, there's other forms of resources that people produce. Even, even if you can measure it, the collaboration, 
we should reward collaboration. <coughs> if you, if we all said how important it was earlier. We don't really reward it. I can't push further. Uh, I, 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 yeah, totally. Can, but I want to talk about some of the things beyond just data sharing, and I'd like to bring in uh, and help. Um, but it's still a very important that. discussion. Feel free to stay after. We'll talk about it. Um, so, I don't know, the cloud computing has been enormously important, um, as we mentioned, for having a democratizing effect, not just for who can access the data, but for what researchers at, at every size and, and you know, well-funded institution can can do. They can they can store data that they can never hope to afford in their own their own local data center. They can analyze massive data sets. It's really supportive of the growth of data intensive science across the board. Um, you know, and just to give an example of, of why this growth is important, that you know, sequencing a whole human genome, I don't know how many, I forget how many petabytes that is. Uh, you know, it originally took 13 years and a couple million dollars to do. Now it can be done for yeah. So now it can be done for thousands of dollars and on, on, a, on a something a time scale closer to a week. And so just the sheer amount of data that that will generate is is massive. It's mind boggling. It's one of probably the like one of the biggest untapped data resources we have. There, so cloud computing has supported this, but there's even there's some talk now speaking of, of challenges that cloud computing might not even be able to keep up with this huge boom. Is that a realistic concern? And if so. How could the industry better accommodate the need for, for, for better storage and analytics capability as these massive data sets get into there? So as, as the resident cloud person here, <laughs> let me uh, take a stab at that. First, uh, we, we sort of have to put a definition for cloud here so that we can talk boundaries, right? And, and for us at AWS, it, it means uh, very certain things. Uh, and it all revolves around being able to self-provision resources for you, right? So to put your data on the cloud, for us means you put data in a space where somebody else can come in and use that data without having to download it. They can use it in place, they can get their own resources, bring in their own funding for the compute, and be able to utilize that data right away, get going. All right. So that, that to us is cloud. Put it in a space where other people can take advantage of it. And uh, the, the, when, when you start talking about that, and start thinking about how do you fund these big cohorts. Uh, and when you have separate institutions, different uh, diseases, uh, cancer is a big one, but that's not our only uh, driver of disease here. There's also uh, you know, diabetes, environmental studies, uh, the upcoming influence of the metagenome on and the microbiome on, on our uh, human health. These are all gonna be separately funded initiatives. And if everybody has to uh, look across these data sets and have to s provide resources themselves to store all of those within a, a central location, that's an unsustainable model for everybody. That's why clouds are attractive for science because you can focus on providing resources for the disease area that is important to you, yet you can enable research across different disease areas as they pay for it and have this cost sharing. If you have a place that's big enough to accommodate everybody. And this gets back to your question about, will the cloud, will these mega providers be big enough to uh, uh, take on that challenge? Uh, if there's money there, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll be, I'll be very transparent there, right? We, we, are, we, are, we, are, uh, we are a commercial business. We do need to look at the bottom line at some point. Yet, the, if you look at the historical, um, <coughs> the historical margins for this business, for, for IT in general, very low margins on, on cloud computing, and that's why it's a cost destructive <coughs> technology because we operate on a cost cost plus, and, and most cloud providers do, right? We 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 have this notion in AWS and in Amazon called the virtuous cycle, right? So, and it all based it's all based on scale. So we can because we buy at a certain scale, we can take advantage of those economies and buy for a cheaper price. And because we have that cheaper price we pass that savings on to the customer. And that makes a better customer, they buy more from us, therefore we can go to bigger scale. Bigger scale means cheaper cost for us, which we pass on to the customer, and vice versa. Right? So, so the larger you get in scale, the more economic it is for everybody involved. So to, to, to that question, yes, we can, we can definitely uh, keep up with what's coming from a lot of different science audiences in the world we are already. Uh, no, maybe, maybe short. Uh, I mean, I, I think we face uh, in Europe. I, I, I'm sure it's in Europe no different. That research infrastructure costs a lot of money, um, but uh, these are normally funded 
<coughs> on the basis of grants which uh, uh, have a time uh, period. So if you get a grant for five years, it's funded for five years, and what happens afterwards? Uh, so then you have the problem, of course, of quality assurance, how, how, what's the quality of your data, you know, it, it, this, these type of issues. Again, this is uh, one of the many reasons, and I think also Jerry listed uh, a number of issues which the so-called European Open Science Cloud is supposed to solve. Uh, so make a sustainable, I mean also financial sustainable solution for everybody. Yeah, and, and I'm all for that. You know, I'm, I'm a part of the Elixir EU uh, Industry Advisory Council. I think that the, the making resources available across the EU and across the world for researchers is definitely an initiative that should be led uh, by national governments to, to really create infrastructures or provide resources into other, uh, into so that the researcher has access to these infrastructures to make a, a, a use of the data assets that they, that they can have access to. Um, it's it's a it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? I mean, <clears throat> yes, everybody wants to support something in country, but then they have to support that plus whatever else is there. So, when you're dealing with really tight budgets, that that it is the case in science, what's the best use of your money? Is it to buy metal boxes or is it to invest in your research staff? And we are much of the opinion. We not, not metal. So, first of all, I should say that earlier this week we had Baron Mons visiting, so who's <coughs> doing a lot of work on the EU cloud project. And we're we're very committed. Uh, you know, we are the NIH, and it's true across other agencies as well to actually address this on a global scale. So, I just put that out there. Um, in terms of, and I just keep harping back to the whole economics of this. So, before I get there, let me just say. The, the whatever we put in the cloud, there's obviously reasons for doing it. The obvious one is when data get, sets get so big, like human microbiome days that was mentioned, or the TCGA, which is the, the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which is going to be a major driver of the moonshot. Um, you know, that you have to take compute to that data. You just can't move that data around effectively. So those, that's, that's obvious. But there's also, I think, the notion of uh, actually access to the data anywhere. I mean, that, that's an obvious piece, but it's actually a very important piece, which actually drives a lot of what we do in, as individuals now in the cloud by virtue of accessing from different devices. So it's obvious, but it's worth stating. Uh, the other part, of course, is we also, as in Europe now, we're trying to all work on the so-called FAIR principles, which is the ability to find, access, which means use, interoperate, and reuse uh, that data. So, you know, it's no good just sticking something out there. We just have someone now that, oh, we can access it easily now. But I just wasted a week trying to figure out what this data was all about. It's, that's okay. Then just, what as, as, as Angel knows, we're trying to give them money. I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> going to get five now. Uh, not just you, I should say. But, it, but we want to do it in a way that's different. And this brings in the economics. So let me just describe very briefly the model we're actually working will put in place, certainly in the next few months. Um, is what, if you think about how we fund research now, you know, someone writes a grant and they put in a line item, say $100,000 for compute, right? We have no idea as a funding agency, and we, that a adds up to probably well over a billion dollars a year when it comes down to it. We have really no idea how people use that money. You know? I mean, you know, it can get siphoned off to other things, and, but it, it's, it's also a forced economy because it doesn't in any way map uh, to usage to demand, all right? So it could be that you buy these servers and they sit there and they're not, they're not used, or they could be overused. So the kind, what cloud computing brings is the opportunity to have much more ability to measure. So the idea that we're playing with and we'll, we'll be experimenting with, and I emphasize it'll just be a pilot, is the idea of credits. So we're not gonna give you money anymore as a researcher. <laughs> we're gonna give you credit. And you're going to get, so say you put a grant for 100000 for the compute, we're going to give you $125,000 worth of credit. Someone says this is like bitcoins. But anyway. And then, but that way, we only actually pay for what you use. And you'll be able to use it in a, in a cloud or other environment, which we call commons compliant. All right, and we could get, in, that's probably beyond the scope of this discussion. But the idea is that that way, we only pay for what you use. We also have the compliance means that there are certain 
rules about the data, right? About the usability, the fine principles. Uh, sorry, the fair principles. So, uh, you know, this is, and who knows whether this will work, but it's an experiment worth trying. We will evaluate whether, as funders of this kind of, do, do we become more efficient? Are we seeing more and better computing done per dollar? We don't know yet, but we're, I think it's an experiment worth trying. And that would have not been possible, this is the plug for you, that would not be possible without the, you know, the resources like AWS, not the only one, but, uh, and, and cloud providers. Great. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple questions about uh, how we can kind of uh, engage the, the EU-US collaboration, what, what kind of problems we can address with that before we turn it over to audience Q&A. Um, so Renee, you specifically, and, and then everyone else, feel free to jump in. What do you think that the, the European Union does particularly well that the U.S. could learn from, or <coughs> vice versa, that the U.S. does particularly well that, 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 that Europe can learn from in terms of promoting this, this open scientific environment? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I'm qualified to uh, give a good answer as well. Um, because uh, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the U.S. Uh, situation. Uh, I, I'm... And I, I would not say that we are very good at things at the moment. <laughs> so, uh, this is of, I mean, probably now fired. I also get fired. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm a, I, I feel a little bit... Uh, you and I will start a company. I, 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 I feel a little bit hesitant. I, I, I'm definitely not on this panel, panel to promote the EU or something like this. But uh, um, what, you know... Uh, but we are lucky in certain things. So uh, uh, we had an, we definitely had an uphill struggle to get uh, open science on the agenda. I mean, uh, uh, I've been working on this for uh, a long time, and uh, we were frustrated in the institution to get this actually high up the agenda. But we were fortunate with a new commissioner uh, who made open science his priority. So. Um, so the good thing is that, uh, of course, if it's high on the political agenda, things get more easily. So we had the success to have this uh, cloud initiative uh, going, which is very important. It's actually supposed to solve all the problems mentioned here. Uh, but I cannot say we are good in it because it's not there yet. So, I mean, uh, Baron Monts decided that he is funded by us in an expert group to, get, to, to clarify what strategy we have to take on the cloud. So we hope to get there and, and solve all these problems. Um, uh, so uh, that's, all, that's, on, that's on that front. Uh, we don't have, I mean, that's on the, on the positive side. So we have this uh, digital signal market initiative under which this cloud uh, initiative features. Uh, we will have also quite some uh, significant amount of funding for doing open science uh, within our framework program for research, which is a pretty large uh, funding program. It's uh, for the seven years, it's 50 billion euro, it's not nothing. Um, so, um, so there are quite some opportunities to advance there. Um, I think we have to do probably better on, on, on data sharing. I, I think if you would really analyze on how, well, what's actually happening, we do have the data sharing program uh, in, in, in our funding. There are requirements for data sharing. We want people to have data management plans and so on. <coughs> um, but uh, I don't have a good view on how much this is actually used. I, I think there, there, there can be some disappointments down the line. I mean, but uh, I, I think we have to improve there a little bit. Um, then I think we have to advance, and that's an, a part of the open science agenda I haven't mentioned yet, um, that we go away uh, from publications <coughs> in journals. I think this is an anachronism. I mean, that we still do this. Uh, I mean, we can publish online, and uh, we have to go to alternative ways of, of uh, open peer review. We have to go to, uh, indeed, credit people doing reviews. Um, we have to share <coughs> the whole way uh, we, uh, we share knowledge and, 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 and also publish our, our, our material. So there's another big agenda ahead. 
I, I think there are some uh, quite interesting uh, initiatives uh, out there, the business models, which I think we have to, to uh, encourage. Uh, but there we are really, I think, in a starting phase. And you see, of course, the main publishers, uh, Elsevier, Springer, and so on, they, they, um, they have other interests, let's put it this way. And, uh, so uh, I personally would have to see an ideal that uh, we could create something like an open science, uh, a scholarly open science commons. Um, but you have, of course, also private actors in the field who try to make monitor, who try to monetize uh, research assessment issues and so on. And uh, these things that may conflict. Uh, the baby lives with uh, the reasons on both sides to do these things. And how this will play out, we have to see in the future. And then going down the line, uh, from a business perspective, from a from an academic perspective, or from a regulatory perspective, what does the U.S. do well that we should continue? We should strengthen efforts that the EU can learn from, or where are we really lacking that we could we could collaborate with Europe to support in terms of the international sharing, or that we could steal their ideas and. Sure, I think uh, just this morning the EBI and both just released a report on their impact of open data and, and tool sharing. Uh, you should probably look it up. <laughs> uh, but you know, given that that, that they're, they're small, hundreds of millions of pounds uh, in infrastructure, and well, EBI has a billion dollar impact across all of the EU, I think it, it, we have similar corollaries with the NCBI and other NIH institutes. The, the amount of funding, again, we gave the example of <coughs> of the Human Genome Project, which did cost a few billion dollars to do, but now has a multi-billion dollar industry following for years on end. So I think that uh, both the Europeans and the U.S. really do tackle hard problems with their public policy and funding that have broad-ranging impact and, and into, the, into the industry, you know, the internet being one of them, genomics being another. Uh, and I think we should continue down that path. Let's let's keep these public-private partnerships really uh, flowing together. And as a as a commercial entity, uh, we're very supportive of the research going on worldwide. I'll speak to the academic side, which is to encourage increased research and attention to this methods to the methods that might work. Uh, the NSF does have a science of science policy group that's a few years going. And this should be a major topic there. I'd seek to see more funding for that uh, newer effort. Uh, I would say celebrate good deeds of Christine Borgman at UCLA and her book about uh, data sharing and data strategies. I would celebrate my colleagues in the School of Information at the University of Maryland, Richard Marciano, whose new Digital Curation <laughs> Innovation Center is meant to provide a home for these kind of research frameworks. And, and to make these things, to raise the prominence of these problems and also celebrate the good work that's been done as, and further, of course, to evaluate the different um, strategies that are being tried to see how well they work out. We just, it, it, it's, I hear a lot of anecdotes here, a lot of we should, they should, and a very kind of, uh, uh, to me, uh, uh, a discussion that needs sharpening in terms of quantitative and, you know, and ethnographic reports about what works and what doesn't work. Carrots and sticks were nicely portrayed. What carrots? What sticks? Do we have a theory of data sharing? Do we have a way to understand what incentives work? Is it money? Is it recognition? Do we understand what penalties work? These are, are I think, substantive, fascinating issues that go back to the socio-technical questions that I think are the dominant ones of this century. And we have to, I would like to see NSF realigned to give greater prominence to socio-technical problems. The, the Social Behavioral Sciences Division is the smallest by far of the eight divisions of NSF. It needs to become much more prominent. And I would say there is some good news. You can look at some hints in programs and programs in different divisions where these things are getting attention, but much more uh, needs to be done. I think the CDI and ITIF's efforts to focus attention are very important. We need to create a, a greater sense of importance of and, and challenge and concern about these issues. They need to get solved. They need to get studied. Thank you.
Okay, I guess the, the, the other thing I would say, and I'm not going to comment on where the U.S. versus the EU is good or bad, I would certainly be fired for that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I think just to point out, I mean, we, know that, we know that science is, is global, it is international. We see increasing international linkages in the way science is done. Policy right, tends to take place at a national level, for good or bad, right? And, and there's, of course, mechanisms for international collaboration, even at the policy level. And I think that means we need to try to match uh, national level policy initiatives kind of to this fabric of global international science and looking even at models of um, some degree of coherence between between policy and I'll say in one hand this is coming maybe back to the sticks side yeah, carrot too is looking at the uh, you know the funder expectations or mandates that are being put on open science so you know in the US we're now at the point where as a result of the, the OSTP memo we have 16, you know, about three quarters of the federal science agencies with public access plans. And those plans are starting to move into implementation now. So in terms of the numbers of agencies that are requiring data management planning at the beginning of projects and are requiring, going back to the old school of, of communication, publications to be made publicly accessible, right? the numbers of those are starting to increase quite rapidly now. We're sort of at the, at the turning point. <coughs> majority of agencies for new funding are, are expecting data management and, uh, and open access or public access to their publications. And I think to the extent that becomes the norm, a global norm, or especially amongst you know the large research funding companies, right, that'll a set uh, a set of expectations for the global science community in terms of, of you know, what they should be trying to do, that scientists should try to do in terms of open science and so forth. Um, I think at, this, you know, at the same time, we have some very successful models of collaboration in open science. We mentioned you know, UBI and, uh, and the NCBI collaborations, right, which also extend to Japan for GenBank, for PubMed Central, uh, where for, I'll say, many years, decades now, right, those groups have been working with, largely with funders and with the scientific communities to sort of you know, get agreement on expectations about data sharing and access to publications publication and building infrastructure that that works right that is providing you know, redundant backup and capacity sharing information among them and I think we can look, try to look at those kinds of models for some inspiration and lessons for what works uh, but I think now it's you know it's a matter of trying to work even much more broadly with the, with the scientific community thinking of it in a global way and I'm sure others on this panel can speak for that as well of other kind of models that have been successful in, in making So I, I guess an undercurrent of what I heard about uh, going down the table was, uh, um, I guess Ben was stated it the best in some ways, is that uh, talk is cheap and action is expensive. And, you know, so here's a, a actually I had two thoughts about action. Uh, one was really, uh, Jerry, I think the relationship between, in, in a, an EU-US uh, capacity, one actually Jerry just alluded to, which is the relationship between EBI and NCBI. I think if we just looked at one, additional element uh, or one additional data resource or one additional feature that could be done as a collaboration between those two organizations and which would of course be offered more globally I think would be uh, you know a good action item the other one I was thinking about um, it relates I'll tell you the, the little story first that leads to it don't worry it's very short uh, I've only been to two scientific talks in my life where there was a standing ovation I'm afraid to say neither one was one I, I gave, but, um, <laughs> but one of them is the person who remained nameless, but it was someone who had been diagnosed with uh, Cordoma's disease, which is a rare form of brain cancer, where you only have seven years to live, you know, on average. When it takes nine months to get a paper out, uh, you know, seven years is, uh, is you know, it doesn't, it doesn't scale. So, and I think there's a growing realization uh, among sci life scientists that we need to improve this situation dramatically. And so next week uh, at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, there's actually a workshop on the notion of really promoting preprint serving in, uh, in, in the life sciences. Now, there has got, it has European representation, it has US representation, it actually has broad global representation. And what's particularly important about it to me is that in some ways it's not preprint servers exist already. But what's really key here is the people who are now getting behind it. So it's being organized in part by 
Ron Vale, who's a distinguished professor at UCSF, but also Howard Varmus, who's a Nobel laureate, uh, had a lot to do with the open access policies that came out of, uh, that came along, and, and certainly as a director of the NIH, I pushed the NIH in that direction. So I think there's a real opportunity here. And so, you know, we're going to have Europeans and we're going to have uh, US folks together. I would really hope out of that we get some action. So we get, you know, a real commitment that, you know, more and more we will put things into preprint service so that, you know, you get post-publication peer review in that context and you make that knowledge <coughs> that's come from those papers, um, good or bad, you make that available essentially as soon as it's completed. You know, that's got to be a pretty significant acceleration. Great. Um, so I have a whole lot more that I want to talk about, and believe me, I will if there's no audience questions, but we're going to open up to the audience. Um, when when I call on you, please uh, say your name, where you're coming from. Um, great. So, uh, Hi, I'm Arthur Allen. I write for Politico. Um, I, I wanted to go back to some of the, um, this is a really interesting panel, um, some of the earlier things we were talking about um, where you're basically just setting up the principle of the importance of data science and how we need to move toward this whole different model of science. And um, <clears throat> somebody mentioned EHRs and using EHRs, which is, you know, one of the big uh, ideas in the Precision Medicine Institute and all over. Um, but, uh, and I, there's no, there are no, there aren't that, you are all data scientists, <coughs> but when you talk to doctors and people who are entering this data, there's lots of problems with it and there's always this you know, garbage in, garbage out concept. And I guess one thing I'm just wondering is, um, is there a forum where um, people like you get together with more sort of, you know, old school scientists and clinicians, uh, for example, to discuss this issue. And it, I mean, do you feel that um, there's consensus about the ideas that you're talking about, or is this sort of you're pulling along people? Because usually if there's resistance, there's good reasons for it. <coughs> I guess uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative just released an RFP uh, to study exactly this, right? Mm -hmm. to, to create a cohort that's not only getting genetic information, but is actually pulling out data from EHRs into a national cohort. Uh, I believe it's going to be 700,000 volunteers who are going to volunteer their information, and then another 100,000 that are more deeply phenotyped from submitting organizations. Uh, probably Phil can give more details uh, on this than, than I can because it's an NIH initiative. Uh, but it, you're looking at the start of programs that are going to address this garbage in, garbage out problem, right? I think we don't have yet outside of, um, at least in the U.S., this is a very different picture in the EU and going back to what the EU does better with their national health uh, networks. Uh, but the uh, within the U.S., outside of um, care provider networks, right? So something within Boston, Partners, uh, Kaiser, they have a sort of um, fairly homogenized mm -hmm. uh, data sets that they can do outcomes research and give better patient care. And I think uh, that works well within a community. It could work much better as you spread across the U.S. and really start co-locating different uh, communities and different environments, uh, different uh, social norms to get at, does this outcomes research that, that worked in the West Coast, uh, that treatment, is it as effective uh, in, the, in the middle of the U.S.? Is it as effective in the Coast where you have very different diets and lifestyles, right? And I think that's really where we're going to. And as far as data standards are concerned, there's the, the FHIR standard that's looking, uh, that's bringing in uh, both the, the major uh, EHR providers to actually provide some notion of a, of a, of a standard format. Uh, there are still issues to be worked out. I thank you for asking a, a very large question that deserves a time of its own. The EHRs is that is my major work, and the tools we've built are designed to show that if we had these interoperable, comparable, high-quality data sets, hey, then we can do these things and that the learning health system can become realized. But, as you point out, the incentives are in the wrong place. The physicians have no incentive to get complete, correct, and thorough data for somebody else to do an analysis. They're caring for their patient. They're trying to get 12-minute sessions done and move on to the next patient. So 
you know, I mean, my favorite story, 6,300 emergency room patients, we get these records, and uh, they've been analyzing the age of the men and the women and those admitted and discharged, and they had no idea that, you know, eight of these patients were 999 years old. And uh, uh, you know how that happened, but it, it's bad data. Or that a large fraction of these patients were under one years old because instead of entering the date of birth, they entered the current year. You get incomplete data. You get redundant data. You get the patient who was admitted to the emergency room 14 times but discharged only twice. <laughs> well, you know why that happens, right? Discharge is a billable event. I am sorry, admission is a billable event, but discharge is not. And so sometimes these things go bad. So that's the kind of thing I want to surface and make visible about the, the really profound, you know, poor quality of the data. And my, my annoyance is when the data mining, machine learning people show up, apply their statistics without looking at the data, without visualizing, without analyzing, and they get garbage out. Okay, and I'm very devoted toward visualization, as you may know, but also the idea of raising the quality of the data, putting the incentives <laughs> in, all the way upstream and getting the feedback and making these things open. That's a big change. And there is, again, that the movement is called Learning Health Systems as a mechanism. Um, celebration for Lynn Etheridge, uh, Chuck Friedman, uh, Kevin Sullivan, people who are working on these things. Another way of sort of stating your question about this is sort of, well, what's in it for me? You know? And I mean, I'm, I've explained that, but perhaps that's not the way of stating it. But uh, And it comes back to the, an underlying theme that's been throughout this meeting, which of course is about being fired. So <laughs> in, the, in, the VA, in the VA sense, it was, you know, when we have been working with the HRs for a long time and it probably has one of the most comprehensive records. Um, Physicians were essentially told, if you want to work for the VA system, you're going to, in a period of time, you're going to have to use this system. Otherwise, you're not going to have a job. So that that's you know that's what that's what's in it for them is their job, right? So but we're beyond that now. So the, the question you've got to ask is, uh, well, what is what what is going to come out of this? And I think you know it, it's it's hard to tell, but I think there are some indicators out there. I mean, there there's lots of you know in terms of the learning system, there's there's lots of evidence that we're starting to see some very exciting <coughs> things. So, you, and you can look at it, let's, let's, as this has got a European theme, let me actually quote some data that's actually from Denmark. So Denmark has you know, a very small population, I think it's six to seven million people, but all of those health records are essentially available and, and in reasonable shape. And you can look at, you can troll across all of those records and you can look at comorbidity. So you can look in a network, you can see a node here, which is a particular condition. And it, you know, there's an edge that goes to another condition. And the thickness of that edge is, you, is what is your likelihood that you're going to get that condition? And you know, before you get it, because we, it's based on data we've collected, they've collected over the last almost 20 years. That is really a, a powerful element of uh, preventive medicine. And I think as, as the, the stakeholders in this enterprise, which is you know, the care providers, the uh, patients themselves, but also the insurance companies and everyone else, because of the economics aspects of it. If you know, when they start to see that value, you know, that's what's in it for them, and that will drive things forward. Um, I can just add one. one yeah, real quick. Do you want to put on my, my, uh, my uh, go ahead, yeah. in my from my previous life when I was also at NIH, right, working on some clinical data initiatives, right? I think this is a good example of how. In, in a typical clinical research study, you put a lot of emphasis on data collection and data quality, right? This is an example. Now we're taking data from a slightly different domain, and there are, as we said, lots of problems with the data quality. There are some examples, right, where, where there's a research group within a, a healthcare system that started cleaning the data because they wanted to be able to mine it for more research. Began feeding that data back to the clinicians, who then started to see the benefit because it actually could help their own treatment. Right? And bringing that kind of feedback process is an important element of this. There are a couple of other, other initiatives you know, that I'll just mention, and I don't know if Phil has more to say about them, the, the healthcare systems collaboratory work, right? which was trying to take you know, a small number of healthcare systems and see if they could do essentially clinical trials based on data and electronic health records that they were the, themselves collecting, and the idea being we do certain kinds of clinical trials and ask certain questions about what really works in practice 
in a much lower cost, well, maybe this sounds like an anachronism, a lower cost setting, but we didn't have to set up a whole new data collection process and set up a, a standard clinical trial to do it. We were going to leverage the, uh, the data that was already being collected. And I think there, the, the purpose of this was to demonstrate and then identify some key lessons from it. And that might be something worth looking into more now as these lessons are starting to come out. Just a phrase for that, the idea that every patient is in a clinical trial all the time. That, you know, if we had good data collection, then you don't need these special things, but every patient is always in a clinical trial. Great. Yeah, my name is Saf Fili, a student of Divine University from Sierra Leone, West Africa. Thanks to the Center for Data Innovation. I have two questions. Environmental sanitation for IT and the data for the most recent Ebola outbreak. I have to thank the American government for the part being played in fighting and mitigating the Ebola outbreak in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. So we have environmental, environmental sustainability, that is green IT. We have two things in our hands, climate scientist and medical scientist. So how innovation is going to be played? Because most of these three here, because of the Ebola outbreak, they had a poor healthcare infrastructure. No data was available. Now we have the environment is coming. How are we going to use the green IT, these two? to pop to it so that the data has been available for future pandemic of Ebola then we have the green IT how are we going to use environment how this IT how are we going to use the environment for clean energy especially in obsolete computer product so this is my question to you as medical scientist and climate scientist <laughs> even after the outbreaks, right? So as, as you start be having, putting in the infrastructure to deal with an outbreak, that infrastructure will still be there after the outbreak and hopefully improve the health outcomes for the long term. Um, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions if they're short, so. Uh, I'll try to make this short. Brian Wee from the US National Ecological Observatory Network. This question actually probably hits An Anhal and Jerry. So uh, suppose Congress, uh, so Congress has really gone through the faster FSTR, fair access to science and technology research, which targets uh, publications. But suppose Congress were to think, you know, maybe we should uh, legislate 
what was in President Obama's open data executive order, what, what was in President Obama's executive order on open data. Maybe they should legislate that. But the question to the private industry is, you know, given your experience on like the Noah crater where uh, Noah had, had set up a crater with uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, the open cloud consortium, I think, and some a couple of others. What would be your reaction to Congress threatening to legislate open data, um, put into law actually what President Obama had 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 uh, put in an executive order? We are part of that creative. Um, we, we've been very effective with our open data program, especially the next ride in NOAA, and I think that we'll continue uh, our relationships, deepening our relationships with the atmospheric community uh, and, and satellite community. I, I'm not sure what an impact uh, that, that Congress could have on those relationships that already exist. So um, maybe. Well, I think even a faster way for me to get fired uh, than commenting on EU US rights would be to, to comment on what Congress should or should not do in this space. Uh, and, and I have. Uh, but, I, but I think, I mean, you know, the question is. Say it to me and I'll say it for you. <laughs> I think it's really a question. I mean, have the, the administration efforts, uh, you know, have they been successful in changing the culture uh, and the practice of, of open science across the federal agency? Uh, recognizing the differences in which the way those agencies operate, what they fund, how they fund the scientific communities that they work with. So, you know, I think that's sort of the question, and I'll leave the other part of your question untouched. If I <laughs> hey, uh, unfortunately, it's right about 10.30. Uh, feel free to stick around um, and talk more. Um, but just on that, that open data issue in particular, uh, that's something that uh, would be incredibly important, given the, the, the value of uh, using or to, to open data in the United States. Anything that can kind of cement that permanence, I think, is really important. Uh, yeah. Bye, Ben. Book. I'm sorry to our panelists that are all going to get fired today. Uh, but thank you so much for coming. Um, well, this will be uh, on our website immediately after we stop the live stream. Um, if we didn't answer any questions, please we'll tune us. We'll get back to you. And feel free to leave a business card in the back and uh, to sign up for our newsletter. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Copies of my resume are on the back of it. <laughs> <laughs>